That's all then, he said. Thank you so much, Miss Bridget. You take care of your mother who needs you rather badly just now. Encourage your young man to renew his studies, and if you can, wean him from withers. Goodbye now. I'm off. Miss Harris was neither plain nor beautiful, short nor tall, dark nor fair. No wonder that few people had noticed her at Marston House. She was not in the least nervous. May we have your name and address? Certainly, Mr. Allen. Dorothea Violet Harris. Address? Town or country? Both, please. Town? 57 Ebury Mews, SW. Country? The Rectory, Barbican Bramley, Bucks. Now, Miss Harris, I wonder if you can give me any help in this business. To his intense astonishment, Miss Harris opened her pad she had brought with her, and he could see a column of shorthand hieroglyphics. She cleared her throat. At about twelve-thirty, she began, I met Lord Robert Gospel in the hall. I was speaking to Miss O'Brien. He asked me to dance with him later in the evening. I remained in the hall until a quarter to one. I happened to glance at my watch. I then went upstairs to top landing, remained there, and went down to ballroom landing before one-thirty. Lord Robert Gospel then asked me to dance. We danced. Three successive dances with repeats. Lord Robert introduced me to several of his friends, and then he took me into the buffet. We drank champagne. He then remembered that he had promised to dance with the Duchess of Dorminster. He took me to the ballroom and asked for the next Viennese waltz. Lord Robert danced with the Duchess, and then with Miss Agatha Troy, and then with two ladies whose names I do not know. The band played the Blue Danube. Lord Robert saw me. We danced together and revisited the buffet. I noticed the time. I had intended leaving much earlier and was surprised to find that it was nearly three o'clock, so I stayed till the end. She glanced up at Alain. Thank you, Miss Harris. You come from Barbican Bramley. Is your father's rectory anywhere near Falconbridge? Oh, no. Falconbridge is thirty miles away. My uncle Walter was rector at Falconbridge. Alain said, Really? Long ago? When I was a small girl. He's retired now and lives in Barbican Bramley. All the Harrises live to ripe old ages. Lord Robert remarked that many of the clergy do. He said longevity was one of the more dubious rewards of virtue. Alan could hear the squeaky voice uttering this gentle epigram. Yes. Now, look here, Miss Harris. We're coming to something rather important. You tell me you went up to the top landing between, say, a quarter to one and one fifteen. Whereabouts were you? Miss Harris turned purple. Well, I mean to say I went into the ladies' cloakroom on the landing to tidy, and then I sat on the gallery again. I think I remember seeing Captain Withers and Mr. Potter through the sitting-room door as I passed to go downstairs. Lord Robert was in the telephone room. How do you know that? I... I heard him. From the cloakroom? The... I, I mean... The room between the cloakroom and the telephone room, perhaps, said Alain, mentally cursing the extreme modesty of Miss Harris. Yes, said Miss Harris, looking straight in front of her. When did you go into this lady's room? As soon as I got upstairs, said Miss Harris. Captain Withers was just coming out of the green sitting room. I think there was a lady in there, and I noticed Sir Herbert in the other sitting room. And then you went into the ladies' room? Yes, admitted Miss Harris, shutting her eyes for a moment. How long did you remain in this room? he asked. White to the lips, Miss Harris gave a rather mad little laugh. <laughs> oh, she said. Oh, quite the time, <laughs> you know. And while you were there, you heard Lord Robert telephoning in the next room? Yes, I did. She's looking at me, thought Alain, exactly like a trapped rabbit. Do you suppose the lady you had noticed was still in the green room when he began telephoning? No, I heard her come out, and, and she she tried to... Tried to... Yes, said Alain, quite, and went away? Definitely. And then Lord Robert began to telephone. Could you hear what he said? Oh, no. I could only hear the tone of his voice, and that was quite unmistakable. Yes, said Alain encouragingly. Now, did you hear the end of the conversation? Oh, yes. Someone came into the room. I heard Lord Robert say, Oh, hello, and almost immediately I heard the telephone tinkle, so I knew he'd rung off. And the other person, was it a man? Yes. Could you, said Alain, recognize this man? Oh, no, cried Miss Harris. No, indeed, Mr. Alain. You returned to the landing? Not immediately. No, when I did return, they'd both gone. I mean, when I finally returned. Of course, Lord Robert went before. And the other man? He... It was most unfortunate. Little mistake. I, I mean, as soon as he realized it was the wrong door, he went out again, naturally. 
The inner door being half glass made it even more unfortunate, though of course there being two rooms was was better for all concerned than if it was the usual arrangement. I think I understand. While you were still in the inner room, the man who had interrupted Lord Robert's telephone conversation came out of the green sitting room and blundered through the wrong door into the anteroom of the ladies' lavatory. That it? Miss Harris blanched at the unfortunate word, but nodded her head. Why are you so sure it was this same man, Miss Harris? Well, because... because I heard their voices as they came to the door of the next room, and then Lord Robert's voice on the landing, and then... then it happened. I think perhaps he was feeling unwell. He... the shape of him... put its hands to its face, and it swayed towards the glass partition, and for a moment leant against it. Thank God, said Miss Harris, with real fervour, I had locked the door. Still, you did not recognise him? No. Well, said Alain. What happened next? He moved away, and I heard the outer door shut. And at last you were able to escape. I waited for a moment. Miss Harris looked carefully at Alain. Perhaps she saw something in his eyes that made her feel, after all, her recital had not been such a terrible affair. It was awkward, she said. Wasn't it? Honestly. Honestly, said Alain, it was. Then your idea is, said Fox as they headed again for Belgrave Square, that this chap in the W.C. was the murderer. Yes, Fox, there's no earthly reason why an innocent person should not admit to interrupting the telephone call and nobody has admitted to it. I'm afraid we'll have to go again through the whole damn boiling and ask every man Jack if they burst across the threshold of Miss Harris's outer sanctuary. And now we have a delightful job ahead of us. We're going to try to bamboozle, cajole, or bully Mrs. Halkett Hackett into giving away her best young man. Charming occupation. And here we are at Halkin Street. The Halkett Hackets of Halkin Street. <laughs> An important collection of aspirates and rending consonants. They were shown into a study smelling of leather and cigars, and waited for five minutes before General Halkett Hackett walked into the room. Hello! Afternoon! What? he shouted. His face was terracotta, his moustache formidable, his eyes china blue. He was the original ramrod brass hat, the subject of all army jokes, kindly or malicious. Sit down, damn bagley killer. Place is getting better than Chicago. Well, what can I do for you? Answer one or two questions, if you will, sir. Course I will. Well, sir, did you walk into the green sitting room on the top landing at one o'clock this morning while Lord Robert Gospel was using the telephone? No, nowhere near the place. Next. What time did you leave Marston House? Between twelve and one. My wife's charge had toothache. Brought her home. Did you return to Marston House? My devil, should I do that? I thought perhaps your wife was... My wife preferred to stay on. Matter of fact, Robert Gospel offered to see her home. He didn't do so, however. She tells me they missed each other. And you, sir, you saw Miss... Birnbaum! Rose Birnbaum! Poor little devil! Call a poppet! Miss Birnbaum, in. Did you stay up? To Alain's astonishment, the general's face turned purple with embarrassment. He blew out his moustache several times and blinked. At last, he said, I did take a turn around the square before I went to bed. Always do. I saw the child to her room, and I came down here. I'm getting an old fellow, and I don't much enjoy the small hours. Looked at the clock. It was half past two. I sat in this chair, trying to make up my mind to go to bed. Couldn't. So, took a walk around the square. That's excellent, sir. You may be able to give us the very piece of information we're after. Did you by chance notice anybody hanging about in the square? No. Did you meet anybody at all? Constable. Alain glanced at Fox. P.C. Titheridge, said Fox. The general said, Wait, that's all I can tell you. When I got in again, I went straight to bed. Your wife had not returned? No, said the general. She had not. Thank you very much, sir. And now, if I may, I'd like to have a word with Mrs. Halkett Hackett. Up went the general's chin again. Very good. I'll tell her, he said, and marched out of the room. Crikey, said Fox. That's Halkett Hackett, that was, said Alain. Why the devil is the funny old article in such a stew over his walk around the square? What did the PC say? Said he noticed nothing at all suspicious. Never mentioned the general. I'll have a word. Alain and Fox stood up as Mrs. Halkett Hackett made her entrance. 
Why, Inspector, do you know I never realized that the day I called about my poor friend's troubles, that I was speaking to Lady Alain's famous son? Inwardly writhing under this blatant recognition of his snob value, Alain shook hands and instantly introduced Fox, to whom Mrs. Halkett Hackett was insufferably cordial. They all sat down. Alain said, I think we may as well begin with that same visit to the yard. The business we talked about on that occasion seems to be linked with the death of Lord Robert Gospel. She sat bolt upright, and he knew she was terrified. But that's absurd. My friend— Mrs. Halkett Hackett, said Alain, I'm afraid we must abandon your friend. We realize beyond all doubt you yourself were the victim of these blackmailing letters. Alain decided to take a risk. I have already spoken to Captain Withers. My God, has Morris confessed? Captain Withers has confessed nothing, and he thought, does she realize the damage she's done? But I don't mean that, Mrs. Halkett Hackett gabbled. You trapped me, it's not fair. What might Captain Withers have confessed? That he was the author of the letter your blackmailer had threatened to use, is that it? I won't answer, I won't say anything more. What conclusion am I likely to draw from your refusal to answer? Believe me, you take a very grave risk if you refuse. Have you told my husband about the letter? No, nor shall I do so if it can be avoided. Come now. Captain Withers is the author of this letter, isn't he? Yes, but did you think he had confessed as much? Why, yes, but— And you suppose Lord Robert Gospel to have been the blackmailer? No, said Alain. Lord Robert was not a blackmailer. Mrs. Halkett Hackett, when did you first miss this letter? About six months ago, after my charade party in the little season. Where did you keep it? In a trinket box on my dressing table. Did you suspect your maid? No. She's been with me for fifteen years. She's my old dresser. I know she wouldn't do it. Have you any idea who could have taken it? I can't think. Except that for my charade party I turned my room into a buffet, and the men moved everything around. But Dimitri superintended the whole time. I don't believe they had an opportunity. I see, said Alain. Following our advice, you carried out the blackmailer's instructions and left your bag in the corner of the sofa at the Constant Street Hall. It was taken. Because Lord Robert deliberately sat next to you, you came to the conclusion that Lord Robert took the bag and was therefore your blackmailer. Why did you not report to the police the circumstances of the affair at the concert? Were you advised to let the case drop as far as the yard was concerned by Captain Withers? I see. That brings us to last night. I must ask you if Captain Withers agrees with your theory that Lord Robert was a blackmailer. He... he simply warned me against Lord Robert. In view of the sums of money the blackmailer demanded, did you think it advisable to keep up your friendship with Captain Withers? She wetted her lips. Our friendship is partly a business relationship. Morris, Captain Withers, has very kindly offered to advise me and... I mean, right now, Captain Withers has in mind a little business venture in which I am interested. This venture of Captain Withers is, of course, the club at Leatherhead, isn't it? Why, yes, but— Now then, said Alain quickly, about last night, Lord Robert offered to see you home, didn't he? You refused or avoided giving an answer. Did you go home alone? She might as well have asked him how much he knew so clearly did he read the question in her eyes. Mrs. Halkett Hackett, do you want an alibi for yourself and Captain Withers, or don't you? She opened her mouth once or twice like a gaping fish, looked wildly at Fox, and burst into tears. Alain waited while scarlet claws scuffled in an elaborate handbag. Out came a long piece of monogrammed tulle. She jerked at it violently. Something clattered to the floor. Alain darted forward and picked it up. It was a gold cigarette case, with a medallion set in the lid and surrounded by brilliance. You frighten me. Mrs. Halkett Hackett said. Alain turned the cigarette case over in his long hands. This is a magnificent case. The medallion is an old one, Italian Renaissance. Do you know its history? No. Morris picked it up somewhere and had it put on the case. Perhaps I ought not to use it. Only last night I left it lying about. Was it in the green sitting room on the top landing? I, I think maybe it was. At what time? I don't know. You sat in this room some time just before one o'clock. Now, when you came out of that room, what did you do? I went into the cloakroom to tidy. I missed the case when I opened my bag in the cloakroom. Right. Did you happen to notice Lord Robert on the landing? He was coming upstairs.
she said. When you came out of the cloakroom, did you go back for your case? No. Morris was in the other sitting-out room, waiting for me. I went in there, and then I remembered my case, and he got it for me. And the telephone rung off. I don't know. Was anyone else on the landing? No. But Donald Potter was in the sitting-room. Will you be very kind and let me keep this case for twenty-four hours? I want to see if anybody else recognizes it. Very well, she said. I think that's all, said Alain. We'll bother you no longer, Mrs. Halkett Hackett. She rose from her chair as a plain girl walked into the room. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. I didn't know. Mrs. Halkett Hackett blundered from the room. The plain girl looked from Alain to Fox. I'm so sorry, she repeated. Ought I to go and see if there's anything I can do? I don't think I should. Mrs. Halkett Hackett is very much distressed over last night's tragedy, and I expect she would rather be alone. Are you Miss Birnbaum? Yes, I am. You're detectives, aren't you? That's us. My name is Alain, and this is Mr. Fox. Oh, how do you do? said Miss Birnbaum. It's dreadful, isn't it? Lord Robert was very kind to me. I hope your toothache's better, said Alain. I didn't have toothache. I just wanted to go home. I hate coming out, added Miss Birnbaum with extraordinary vigour. That's bad luck. Why do you do it? Because, said Miss Birnbaum with devastating frankness, my mother paid Mrs. Halkett Hackett five hundred pounds to bring me out. I've never breathed a word about it before, but you look like my kind of person, and I'm absolutely fed up. I'm simply not the social kind. What would you like to do? I want to be an art student. Well, I suppose I mustn't keep you. I should like to keep you for a minute, if I may. That's all right, then, said Miss Birnbaum, and sat down. Last night the general took you home, didn't he? Yes, he was kind. Did you go to sleep? No. I tried to think of a way to write to Mother so that she would let me give it up. Did you hear the others return? I heard Mrs. Halkett Hackett come in frightfully late. She goes past my door to her room, and she's got Diamante shoe buckles that make a clicking noise with every step. I had heard the clock strike four. Did the general go back to the dance? He went out again, I think. Well, then, it must have been the general I heard come along the passage at a quarter past three. I heard every clock chime from one till six. Then I fell asleep. Do you think this will make any difference to the coming out game? Is she going to be ill? I thought so lots of times lately. She's so bloody-minded. Don't say she and don't say bloody-minded. The one's common and you're too young for the other. Miss Birnbaum grinned delightedly. Well, she said, it's what I think anyway. And she's not even virtuous. Do you know the Withers person? He's her boyfriend. I hate her. She's a wicked woman. She says things to me that twist me up inside. They hurt so. Yesterday she told me there was a good deal to be said for the German point of view, and asked me if I had any relations among the refugees, because she had heard quite a number of English people were taking them as maids. I hope she is a murderess. I hope you catch her. I hope they hang her by her beastly old neck until she's dead. Miss Birnbaum was trembling very slightly. Alain rubbed his nose and said, Do you feel any better for that? Yes. Vindictive little devil. Well, I dare say you're nearer to escape than you imagine. I'll be off now. I hope we meet again. So do I. They shook hands in a friendly manner, and she saw them out. It was nearly six o'clock when Alain and Fox returned to Scotland Yard. Fox and Alain tackled the reports that had come in while they were away. They both lit pipes, and between them was established that pleasant feeling of unexpressed intimacy that comes to two people working in silence at the same job. Presently, Alain put down the reports and looked across at his friend. Finished? Yes, sir. There's the report on the silver cleaning. Young Carew got himself up as a rat and mice destruction officer and went around all the houses and palled up with the servants. All the Carrados silver was cleaned this morning, including Sir Herbert's cigar case, which isn't the right shape anyway. Sir Daniel's man does his silver cleaning on Mondays and Fridays, so it was all cleaned up yesterday. Francois does Dimitri's stuff every day. Young Potter and Withers are looked after by the flat service, and only their table silver is kept polished. The Halkett Hackett's cases are cleaned on Fridays. Hmm. How's the report from Bailey? Nothing in the taxi. He got Withers' prints from my cigarette case, but the green sitting room was simply a mess. 
He's found Withers and Young Potter's prints on the pages of Taylor's medical jurisprudence, the pages that refer to asphyxiation. They will tell us that when the newspaper report came out, they were interested and turned up Taylor on suffocation, and who's to call them liars? The man who went to Leatherhead had a success. Apparently Withers keeps a married couple there. He found a roulette wheel, and the middle dozen slots had been very slightly opened. I expect the idea is that Master Donald or some other satellite of Withers should back the middle dozen. Luckily for us, the married couple had had a violent row with the gallant captain and were prepared to talk. I think we've got enough to pull him in on a gambling hell charge. Thompson reports that Withers has stayed in all day. The telephone was disconnected as soon as we left. Donald Potter's clothes were returned to him by taxi. Nobody has visited. Dimitri went home after he left here. He, too, has remained indoors and has made no telephone calls. How the blazes are we going to get any of these victims to charge, Dimitri? You're asking me? said Fox. Yes. Not a hope in a hundred. As I see the case now, Fox, it presents one or two highlights— most of them seem to be concentrated on cigarette cases, the murderers and Mrs. Halkett Hackett's. After the cigarette cases comes the lost letter written by Paddy O'Brien's friend that somebody seems to have stolen eighteen years ago in Buckinghamshire. Odd, isn't it, that Miss Harris's uncle was sometime rector of Falconbridge, the village where Paddy O'Brien met with his accident? I think our next move is to go down to Barbican Bramley. Then there's Lady Lorimer. I'll have to check Sir Daniel Davidson's account of himself. And don't forget we haven't found the cloak and hat, Fox said. What would anyone do with a cloak and a hat if they wanted to get rid of them? You couldn't burn them in any of these London flats. It was low tide, and they'd have had to be dropped off the bridge, which could have been a pretty risky thing to do. Do you reckon they'll try leaving them at a railway office? I rather fancy the parcels post myself. I've sent out the usual request. The telephone rang. Alain answered it. His mother's voice asked if he would dine with her. I'd like to. When? Eight. But we can have it earlier, if you like. I'm all alone. I'll come now, Mama. We'll have it at eight. Alain went by taxi to the flat Lady Alain had taken in Catherine Street for the London season. Hello, darling, she said. Help yourself to a drink. He got his drink and wondered vaguely why he should feel so dog-tired. He was used to missing a night's sleep. It must be because it was bunchy. He had a great deal of charm, said Alain aloud. Yes, a great deal of charm. I suppose Mrs. Halkett Hackett comes into the picture, and Withers? What makes you think so? He had his eye on them, both there and at the Halkett Hackett's cocktail party. Evelyn Carrados, too. We'd better change jobs, darling. You can go into the yard and watch people having their eyes on each other, and I'll sit in Chaperone's corner and make conversation with Lady Lorimer. I've got to see her sometime soon, by the way. She's got to supply half an alibi for Sir Daniel Davidson. He was the last man to leave before Bunchy. Well, I can easily ring her up and ask her to tea. She shouts so loudly you need only sit beside me to hear every word. All right, said Alain. Let's try. Ask her if she saw anything of Bunchy as she was leaving. Lady Lorimer's telephone was persistently engaged, but at last they got through. "'Is that you, Lucy?' "'My dear!' shouted the receiver. "'I'm so glad. I've been longing to speak to you. Too awful. And you know he was to dine with me tonight. I shall never forgive myself, of course, that I did not offer to drive him, and as it turned out, with the Prime Minister being so ill, I might have done so. I can't describe the agony, Helena. I felt Sir Daniel must examine me without losing a moment.' And then I saw him coming out of the door. Sir Daniel, Sir Daniel, he crossed the street, was extremely agitated. The Prime Minister had developed some terrible complaint. Mad, said Lady Alain to her son. I can't tell you how much it has upset me, but I hope I know my duty, Helena, and having just recollected that your boy was a constable, I said to myself that he should learn of this extraordinary man, whom I'm firmly persuaded is an assassin. What other explanation can there be? "'Sir Daniel Davidson!' exclaimed Lady Alain. "'Good heavens, Helen, are you mad? "'How could it be my poor Sir Daniel, who was already on his way to Downing Street? "'Do you remember a play called The Face at the Window? "'I assure you I screamed aloud. "'The nose was flat and white, and the moustache quite frightful. "'The eyes rolled. I could do nothing but clutch my pearls. "'Go away!' I screamed. "'My chauffeur, fool that he is!' 
had seen nothing, and by the time he roused himself it had disappeared. Alain held a sheet of paper before his mother's nose. On it he had written, Ask her who it was. Have you any idea who it was, Lucy? asked Lady Alain. There is no doubt whatsoever in my mind, Helena. The peeping Tom of Peckham. Though how he has managed to go there every night from Halkin Street, Alain gave a stifled exclamation. There is no doubt that his wife's appalling behaviour has turned his head. He suspected poor Robert Gospel. You must have heard how he asked her to let him take her home. No doubt he was searching for them. The jury will bring in a strong recommendation for mercy, or perhaps they will find him guilty but insane, as no doubt he is. Lucy, whom are you talking about? Don't be a fool, Helena. Who should it be but George Halkett Hackett? Well, Roderick, said Lady Alain when she'd got rid of Lucy Lorimer, it seems to me that Lucy has at last gone completely insane. Do you for an instant suppose that poor old General Halkett Hackett is the peeping Tom of Peck and the whole thing's preposterous? It's so preposterous that I'm afraid it must be included in my dreary program. Would you care to come to a nightclub with me, Mamma? No, thank you, Rory. I thought not. I must go alone to the matador. Then I'll go home and to bed. May I use your telephone? Alain rang up Fox and asked him if he'd seen the constable on night duty in Belgrave Square. Yes, said Fox. He says he didn't report having seen the general because he didn't think anything of it, knowing him so well. When was this? About three-twenty. Our chap says he didn't notice the general earlier when he took the young lady home. And one of these link men has reported he noticed a gentleman in a black overcoat with a white scarf pulled up to his mouth and a black trilby hat standing for a long time in the shadow on the outskirts of the crowd. Thinks he had a white moustache. I thought I'd arrange for this chap to get a look at the general and see if he can swear to him. You do. I'm going to go to the matador and then home. Ring me up if there's anything. Very good, Mr. Alain. Good night. Good night, Br'er Fox. The Matador Commissionaire was a disillusioned giant in a plum-coloured uniform. Alain gave him good evening and walked into the entrance hall. He looked for the office where he found the manager, a Mr. Cuthbert. It's nothing very momentous. I want you to tell me what time Captain Morris Withers arrived at this club last night. I'm afraid I have no idea at all, said Mr. Cuthbert. That's a pity, said Alain. If you can't, I'll have to ask all your guests if they saw him, and I shall have to insist on seeing the book. I'm sorry, what a bore for you. Mr. Cuthbert looked at him with the liveliest distaste. He came in late. We had a crowd of people who came on from the Marlston House Ball at about half-past three or quarter to four, and then there was a bit of a lull. A good deal later, Captain Withers signed in. Mrs. Halkett Hackett arrived with him, didn't she? I don't know the name of his partner. A tall, big, blonde woman of about forty to forty-five with an American accent. Perhaps you wouldn't mind calling— All right, then, all right, she did. Was it as late as half-past four when they arrived? As a matter of fact, it was a quarter-past four. There'd been such a long gap with nobody coming in that I did happen to notice the time. That's perfectly splendid. Now, if you'll sign a statement to this effect, I don't think I need bother you any more. Delighted, I'm sure, said Mr. Cuthbert unhappily. I'll sign. Mr. Cuthbert cordially invited Alain to accompany him into the dance room. The sound of the band swelled into a rhythmic, all-pervading rumpus. Alain stood just inside the entrance, trying to accustom his eyes to the scene, while Mr. Cuthbert prattled innocently of the blameless charm of his club. Alain was about to turn away when he knew abruptly that someone was watching him. He turned to the left, and there, at a corner table, sat Bridget O'Brien and Donald Potter. Bridget made a quick gesture, inviting him to join them. He said, I see some friends. Do you mind if I speak to them for a moment? Mr. Cuthbert melted away on a wave of tactfulness. Alain walked over to the table and bowed. Good evening. We want to speak to you, said Bridget. What is it? asked Alain. It's Bridget's idea, said Donald. I can't stand it any longer. He's got nothing to fear, said Bridget. I've told him. Look here, said Alain. This doesn't seem a particularly well-chosen spot for the kind of conversation that's indicated. The manager here knows I'm a policeman, so we better not leave together. Here's my address. Come along in about fifteen minutes. Alain walked restlessly about his sitting room. He was fond of this room. 
It had a contradictory air of monastic comfort that was, if he had realized it, a direct expression of himself. Dürer's praying hands were raised above his mantelpiece. At the other end of the room, Troy's painting of the wharf at Suva uttered in sharp, cool colors a simple phrase of beauty. He had bought this picture secretly from one of her exhibitions, and Troy did not know that it hung there in his room. A taxi came up the cul-de-sac and stopped. The door banged. He heard Bridget's voice and went to let them in. He was reminded vividly of two small children entering a dentist's waiting room. Donald was the victim, Bridget the not-very-confident escort. Alain produced cigarettes, and remembering they were grown-ups, offered them drinks. Bridget refused. Donald, with an air of grandeur, accepted a whiskey and soda. Now then, said Alain. What's it all about? Bridget turned to Alain. When we met tonight, she began, I made Donald tell me exactly what he knows about wits. Well, wits is a crook. Isn't he, Donald? Because he runs a gambling hell at Leatherhead, and Donald said he'd go in with him, only he didn't know then how crooked wits was. And then Donald lost money to wits, and couldn't pay him back, and wits said he'd better stand in with him because he'd make it pretty hot for Donald if he didn't. And then when he quarrelled with Bunchy and went to live with wits, he found out that wits was worse of a crook than ever. He was getting money from a woman. Do I have to tell you who she was? Was it Mrs. Halkett Hackett? Yes. Well, anyway, said Bridget, this afternoon Donald's things came back from Wits's flat. When he unpacked them, he saw one book was missing. The first volume of Taylor's Medical Jurisprudence? Donald wetted his lips and nodded. That upset Donald awfully, because after they read the papers this morning, Donald and Wits had an argument about how long it took to... to... To asphyxiate anybody? asked Alain. Yes, and Donald looked it up in his book. Did Captain Withers handle the book? Donald said, Yes, he did. He read a bit of it and then lost interest. He thought it would have taken longer, he said. Donald was puzzled about the book not arriving and about Wits telling him not to come to the flat, so he rang up. When Wits heard Donald's voice, he simply cut him off without another word, didn't he, darling? Yes, said Donald. I rang again and he didn't answer. Well, Donald got so rattled that he felt he had to see him. Now you go on, Donald. With unsteady fingers, Donald lit a fresh cigarette. When I walked into the sitting room, he was lying on the divan bed. I said I wanted to know why he'd behaved as he did. I said something about you, sir, and in a split second he was on his feet. I thought he was going to start a fight. He asked me what the bloody hell I'd said to you about him. I said I'd avoided speaking about him as much as possible, but he began to ask all sorts of questions. God, he did look ugly. He said, he said that unless I kept my head and held my tongue, he'd begin to talk himself. He said that after all, I had quarreled with Uncle Bunch, and I had been in debt, and I was Uncle Bunch's heir. He said if he was in this thing up to his knees, I was in it up to my neck. He pointed his flat finger at my neck. Then he told me to remember, if I didn't want to commit suicide, that when he left Marston House, he went to his car and drove to the Matador. I was to say that I'd seen him drive off with his partner. Did you see this? No, I left after him. He stopped and took a deep breath. <sighs> after seeing Wits this evening, I believe he murdered my uncle. Proof? I've none. Only the way he spoke tonight. It seemed enough to bring me here when I might have kept quiet. The telephone rang. Alain answered it. Roderick, is that you? It's Evelyn Carrados. Roderick, I'm so worried. Bridgie has gone out without saying a word to anyone. I'm so terrified she's done something wild and foolish. Thank heaven Herbert's out at a regimental dinner at Tunbridge. It's all right, Evelyn, said Alain. Bridget's here with me. She wanted to talk to me. She's quite all right. I'll bring her back. Is Donald Potter there? Yes. But why? Roderick, I want to see you. I'll come and get Bridget, may I? Yes, do, said Alain, and gave her his address. He hung up the receiver and turned to find Bridget and Donald looking very startled. Donna, whispered Bridget. Oh, golly. Your mother won't be here for ten minutes, said Alain. Look here, Donald, I want a full account of this gambling business. If I put you in another room, will you write one for me? It will, I hope, lead to Captain Withers' conviction. I'll do it. Alain took him into the dining room and settled him there with pen and paper and returned to find Bridget looking very frightened. Does Bart know? No but your mother's been very worried. Well, that's not all me. You may not have realized what a temper Bart got. I didn't until I was about fifteen. Donna had been ill, and she was sleeping very badly. 
I said, we must have Sir Daniel. I went downstairs into Bart's study because I told the butler to show Sir Daniel in there. And then Sir Dan came in and I told him about Donna. Did you notice in the study there's a French escritoire thing on a table? Yes. Well, Sir Dan adores old things and he raved about it and said it was a beautiful piece and told me when it was made and how they used sometimes to put little secret drawers in them and you just touch a screw and they fly out. So when Sir Dan had gone up to Donna, I tried prodding the screws with a pencil. And a little drawer did fly out triangularly, sort of. There was a letter in it. I didn't touch it, but while I was looking at the drawer, Bart came in. He went absolutely stark, ravers, took hold of my arm and twisted it so much I screamed. And then he called me a little bastard. I believed he'd have hit me if Sedan hadn't come down. Sedan had one glance at my arm. I had short sleeves. And then he said in a lovely, dangerous sort of voice, Are you producing another patient for me, Carados? Bart banged the little drawer shut and tried to pretend I'd slipped on the polished floor and he'd caught me by the arm. When Sedan had gone, Bart apologised to me and said he was really terribly nervy and had never recovered from the war, which was pretty good as he spent it in Tunbridge Wells. He said there was a letter from his mother in the drawer and it was very sacred. He's never forgiven me and I've never forgotten. My private belief is there was something about his miserable past in that drawer. It's a queer story, isn't it? she said. Very queer indeed said Alain. Have you ever told anyone else about it? No, only Donald. Tell me, said Alain. Do you think anyone else knows the secret of that French writing case? I shouldn't think so. Has Sir Daniel ever been alone in that room? I don't think he's been in the study before or since, and he was never alone there that day. Has Dimitri the catering man ever been alone in that room? He interviewed Donna there about a month before our ball dance, I went down first, and he was alone in the room. Can you remember the date? It was on the 10th of May. We were going to Newmarket, and Dimitri came early in the morning because of that. See here, said Alain. I want you to forget about all of this. Don't speak of it to anyone, not even to Donald. I want you to promise. All right, I promise. The front doorbell rang. Here's your mother, said Alain. When Evelyn Carrados walked into the sitting-room, Alain was not prepared for her haunted eyes and the drawn nervousness of her mouth. "'Come and sit down, Evelyn,' he said. "'There's nothing to worry about. I would have brought your daughter home, but she had some interesting news, and I thought you would trust her with me for half an hour.' "'Yes, Roderick, of course. Where's Donald? I thought he was here.' "'He's in the next room. Shall we send Bridget to join him for a minute or two? Please?' "'Don't interrupt him,' said Alain as Bridget went out. "'All right.' The door closed behind her. Now then, Alain said, there's no need for you to fuss about Bridget. She's been, on the whole, a very sensible young person, and her only fault is in giving a commonplace visit the air of a secret elopement. Was that all that worried you? No. It's Herbert. He stayed indoors all day, and he never takes his eyes off me. I asked my secretary, Miss Harris, to join us at tea, because I thought if she was there it might be a little easier. Most unfortunately, poor Miss Harris began to speak to Bridget about Bunchy. She said she'd been reading a book on famous trials, and somehow or other the word blackmail cropped up. I, I looked up to find Herbert's eyes fixed on me with an expression of, of knowing terror. He didn't go with the others after tea, but hung about the room watching me. Suddenly, he said, you were very friendly with Robert Gospel, weren't you? Then he asked me to show him my bank book. I put him off by saying I couldn't find the book. Suddenly, he asked me if Bunchy had ever called when I was out. He sat, glaring at me, and then he said, did he know anything about old furniture? Alain glanced up quickly. Old furniture? It sounds demented, doesn't it? Then Herbert said, antiques, pieces like the escritoire in my study. I said, Herbert, what are you talking about? And he said, I suppose I'm going to pieces. I feel I have been surrounded by treachery all my life. I asked him how he could talk like that. I began to say that Bridget was always loyal when he burst out laughing. Your daughter, he said, loyal. How far do you suppose her loyalty would take her? Would you care to put it to the test? When did you marry him, Evelyn? When? Two years after Paddy died. He had wanted me to marry him before. He'd always been rather attached to me. I suppose you wonder why I married him, don't you? Perhaps you felt that you needed security. It was exactly that. But it wasn't fair. He's a mass of repressions. And queer, twisted thoughts. Do you know, I think he is still intensely jealous of Paddy's memory. 
Did you see much of him before Paddy died? Yes. I'm afraid, poor Herbert, that he rather saw himself as the faithful, chivalrous friend who continued to adore me quite honourably after I was married. In a way, he was our greatest friend. Why, in a way, I owe it to Herbert that I was in time to see Paddy before he died. How did that come about? It was Herbert who drove me down to the vicarage at Falconbridge on the day Paddy died. The inquest on Lord Robert Gospel was held at eleven o'clock the next morning. The coroner was a cross-grained man with the poorest possible opinion of society with a small s and a perfectly venomous hatred of society with a large one. He addressed the jury in words that left them in no possible doubt as to the verdict they should return, and when they had duly returned it, ordered an adjournment. The whole proceedings had lasted twenty minutes. Swish! said Fox when he met Alain in the street outside. That's old slap-bang, here we are again. You can't beat him for speed, can you, sir? Mercifully, you can't. Fox, we're off to Barbican Bramley. I borrowed my mother's car, and I've a hell of a lot to tell you. And I rather think the spell is wound up. Sir? You're quite right, Fox. Never quote. And if you do, certainly not from Macbeth. Lady Alain's car was parked in a side street. Fox and Alain got into it and headed for the Uxbridge Road. On the way, Alain related Bridget's and Donald's and Lady Carrados's stories. When he had finished, Fox grunted, and they were both silent for ten minutes. Do you think the cloak and hat may still be hidden away in, well, in the guilty party's house, sir? No, I think he got rid of them yesterday before we had covered the first phase of investigation. By post? Where would he send them? ruminated Fox. Put yourself in his place. What address would you put on an incriminating parcel? Care of Private Hu Flung Dung, 42nd Battalion, Chop Suey, Mahjong, Manchuria, to wait till called for, suggested Fox irritably. Something very like that, Br'er Fox. They found the Reverend Mr. Walter Harris's house without any difficulty. The grounds in which it stood were an eighth of an acre of charming cottage garden, and the Reverend and Mrs. Walter Harris were very old indeed. Upon Mrs. Harris's hair, rather than her head, was a wide garden hat. Her husband wore an ancient Panama with a faded green ribbon. Alain said, I'm so sorry to bother you. We are police officers investigating a case and are anxious to trace a letter which we believe to have been lost in Falconbridge between seventeen and eighteen years ago. There was a motor accident on the bridge. The driver, Captain O'Brien, was severely injured and was taken into the rectory. Dear me, yes. Can you remember anything about a letter that was lost on the occasion of Captain O'Brien's accident? To be sure I do, said Mrs. Harris. I sent it after him. It was after they had taken him away that we found it under the couch in the study. Why, I said, why it must have dropped out of that poor fellow's coat. And I said to little Violet... Pop on your bicycle and take it to the hospital as quickly as you can, dear, because they may be looking for it. So, little Violet. Who was little Violet? Our niece. She was spending her holidays with us. She's grown up now and has a delightful post in London with the Lady Carados. Thank you, said Alain. Please go on. But there was not much more to tell. Apparently, Violet Harris had bicycled off with Paddy O'Brien's letter, and had returned to say she had given it to the gentleman who had brought the lady in the motor car. The gentleman had been sitting in the motor car outside the hospital. Well, ejaculated Fox, well, as Alain drove away down Oak Apple Lane. Before this evening, Fox, I want to make certainties of our suspicions. And when we get back, we'll have to arrange for these people to come round to the yard. We'll want Miss Harris, Bridget O'Brien, her mother, Carados himself, Davidson, Withers, Dimitri, and Mrs. Halkett Hackett. When shall we get them to come, sir? It'll be four o'clock by the time we're back to the yard. I think we'll make it nine o'clock. It's going to be devilish tricky. At the yard, they found reports from the officers who were out on the job. Dimitri's men reported that Francois had gone to the local stationers and bought a copy of this morning's Times. The stationer had told the yardman that Dimitri, as a rule, took the Daily Express. Beat up a Times, Br'er Fox. Alain brought his file up to date, and then he rang up Lady Carados. Fox returned with the Times, which he laid on Alain's desk. 
He pointed a stubby finger at the personal column. What about the third from the top? he said. Alain read it aloud. Childy darling, living in exile, longing, only want daughter. Daddy. You better ask Father Times about Daddy. I'll do that, said Fox, and I'll get going on these people for tonight. Thank you, Fox. I must report to the AC. Ask them to show Lady Carrados up here and ring through when she arrives. On his return to his own room, he found Fox was waiting for him. Lady Carrados is downstairs, sir. Go and bring her up, Fox, will you? Fox turned in the doorway. I've got onto the Times, he said. The Childy Darling thing came by mail with a postal order for double rates and a request that it should appear very particular in this morning's edition. The note said the advertiser would call to collect the change, if any, and was signed W.A.K. Smith. Address G.P.O. Erith. Postmark? They lost the envelope, but he'll look for it. The writing, said Fox, was in script on common notepaper. There's one other thing. A clerk at the main western district reported that during the rush hour yesterday someone left a parcel on the counter. It was soft, about the right weight, and had five bob in tuppity stamps on it. He remembers the address was to somewhere in China, and it was written in script. So, my private Hu Flung Dung may have been a fair guess. We've got on to Mount Pleasant, and it's too late. A parcels post went out to China this afternoon. Blast, said Alain. I'll be off, said Fox, and get her ladyship. While he waited for Lady Carrados, Alain cut the little notice out of the Times, and taking out Mrs. Halkett Hackett's gold cigarette case, opened it, and neatly gummed the notice inside the lid. Fox showed Lady Carrados in and went away. Evelyn, I want you to give me permission to talk to your husband in front of you about Paddy O'Brien. You mean, tell him that we were not married? I should not do it if it wasn't vitally necessary. I do not believe, Evelyn, that he would— Alain hesitated. That he would be as shocked as you imagine. It will certainly help us to see justice done on your blackmailer. She looked at him. Quite deliberately, he used the whole force of that thing people call personality. She raised her hands and let them fall limply back on her lap. Very well. I'll do whatever you think best, Roderick. The merciless scent of flowers was so heavy that it hung like mist on the cold air. The room was crowded with flowers. In the centre, on three shrouded trestles, Robert Gospel's body lay in its coffin. It was the face of an elderly baby dignified by the possession of some terrific secret. Alain was not troubled by the face. All dead faces looked like that. But the small fat hands which in life had moved with staccato emphasis were obediently folded, and when he saw these, his eyes were blinded by tears. After a minute he went out into the hall. In the doorway he met Troy. He heard his own voice saying, Hello, you're going to save my life. It's nearly five. I had six hours sleep in the last fifty-eight hours. That's nothing for us hardy coppers, but for some reason I'm feeling sorry for myself. Would you take tea or a drink or possibly both of me? For God's sake, say that you will. Very well. Where should we go? My flat? Unless you object to my flat? I'm not a deputant said Troy. I don't think I need coddle my reputation. Your flat let it be. On the way, Alain was so filled with astonishment at finding himself agreeably alone with Troy that he fell into a trance from which he only awoke when he pulled the car up outside his own flat. When they were indoors, he was delighted to hear her say, This is peaceful, and to see her pull off her cap and sit on a low stool before the fireplace. Shall we have a fire? asked Alain. Do say yes, it's not a warm day, really. Yes, let's, agreed Troy. Will you light it while I see about tea? He went out of the room to give Vasily a series of rather confused orders, and when he returned, there was Troy, before the fire, bareheaded, strangely familiar. It's a nice room, this. He put a box of cigarettes on the floor beside her and took out his pipe. Troy turned and saw her own picture of Suva at the far end of the room. Oh, yes, said Alain. There's that. How did you get hold of it? I got someone to buy it for me. Do you remember how I found you that day painting and cursing? It was just as the ship moved out of Suva. 
Those sulky hills and that ominous sky were behind you. We had a row, didn't we? We did. In fact, said Alain, there is scarcely an occasion on which we have met when we have not had a row. Why is that, do you suppose? I've always been on the defensive. Have you? For a long time I thought you merely disliked me. No, you got under my guard. If it hadn't been for that damned case, things might have gone better, said Alain. You don't happen to love me. Why the devil should you? You don't happen to understand, said Troy shortly. And why the devil should you? I tell you what, I've always been frightened of the whole business. Love and so on. The physical side? Much more than that, the whole business. The breaking down of all one's reserves. Troy looked at him with a shy determination that made his heart turn over. Vasily came in with tea. He had, Alain saw at a glance, excitedly rushed out to his favourite delicatessen shop round the corner and purchased caviar. His face was wreathed in smiles of embarrassing significance. Caviar? said Troy. Oh, how glad I am! A heavenly tea! Vasily broke into a loud laugh, excused, and bowed himself out. You've transported the old fool, said Alain. What is he? A Russian carryover from a former case of mine. When they had finished, Troy said, I must go. Not yet. I shall commit a heinous impropriety and tell you I may make an arrest this evening. You know who killed Bunchy? We believe we do. If tonight's show goes the right way, we shall be in a position to make the arrest. He looked into her face. Ah, he said. My job again. Why does it revolt you so much? Troy said. It's nothing reasonable. It's simply that I've got an absolute horror of capital punishment. With a nervous movement, she touched his head. It's not you. Yet I mind so much that it is you. Alain pulled her hand down against his lips. Everything he had ever felt, every frisson, had been but preparation for this moment when her hand melted against his lips. Presently he found himself leaning over her. He still held her hand like a talisman. He took her face between his hands and kissed her hard on the mouth. He felt her come to life beneath his lips. Then he let her go. I don't think I shall ask you to forgive me, he said. You've no right to let this go by. You're too damn particular by half, my girl. I'm your man and you know it. They stared at each other. That's the stuff to give the troops, Alain added. The arrogant male. The arrogant turkey cock, Troy said shakily. Let me go away now. I want to think. I promise you I did not believe I loved you. It seemed to me that I couldn't love you when I resented so much that you made some sort of demand whenever we met. I'm just plain frightened, and that's a fact. You shall go. I'll get a taxi. He ran out and got a taxi. When he returned, she was standing in front of the fire, looking rather small and lost. I've been very weak, said Troy. When I said I'd come, I thought I would keep it all very peaceful and impersonal. You look so worn and troubled, and it was so easy just to do this. Now see what's happened. The skies have opened and the stars have fallen. I feel as if I'd run the world in the last hour. And now you must leave me. Alain glanced at the two chairs under the central lamp, and then at the assistant commissioner sitting motionless in the green shaded light from his desk. Alain himself stood before the mantelpiece. Stage set said the quiet voice beyond the green lamp. And now the curtain rises. There was a brief silence, and then the door opened. Sir Herbert and Lady Carrados, sir. Alain moved forward, greeted them formally, and then introduced them to the assistant commissioner. Carrados's manner was a remarkable mixture of the condescension of a viceroy and the fortitude of an early Christian martyr. They sat, the two heads turned in unison to Alain. Alain said, most of what I have to say is addressed to you, Sir Herbert. We have reason to believe that the murder of Lord Robert Gospel is the outcome of blackmail. The connection between this crime and blackmail leads us to one of two conclusions. Either Lord Robert was a blackmailer and was killed by one of his victims, or possibly someone wishing to protect his victim. 
What makes you say that? asked Carrados hoarsely. Just a minute, sir, if you don't mind. I want you now to go back with me to a day nearly eighteen years ago when you motored Lady Carrados to a village called Falconbridge in Buckinghamshire. It was the day on which Captain Paddy O'Brien met with his accident. Alain saw the sweat around Carrados's eyes shine in the lamplight. You remember that Captain O'Brien was taken first to the vicarage and from there in an ambulance to the hospital where he died a few hours later? Yes. You remember that after he died, your wife, as she is now, was very distressed because she believed that a certain letter which Captain O'Brien carried had been lost. I have no recollection of this. Lady Carrados, did you ask Sir Herbert if he had inquired everywhere for this missing letter? Yes. I think I remember something. Did you succeed in finding the letter? I don't think so. Do you remember sitting in your car outside the hospital while Lady Carrados was with Captain O'Brien? Carrados did not speak. Lady Carrados, said Alan, did you leave Sir Herbert in the car when you went into the hospital? Yes. Yes, now, Sir Herbert, while you waited there, do you remember a schoolgirl of fifteen or so coming up on her bicycle? How the devil could I remember a schoolgirl on a bicycle eighteen years ago? Only because she gave you the letter that we have been discussing. Evelyn Carrados uttered a stifled cry. Sir Herbert, did you take that letter from the schoolgirl on the bicycle? I have no recollection of it, he said. Alain nodded to Fox, who went out and ushered in Miss Harris. Good evening, Miss Harris, said Alain. Good evening, Mr. Alain. Good evening, Lady Carrados. Good evening, Sir Herbert. Good evening, concluded Miss Harris with a collected glance at the assistant commissioner. Miss Harris, said Alain, do you remember staying with your uncle, Mr. Walter Harris, when you were fifteen? Yes, Mr. Alain, certainly, said Miss Harris. Carrados uttered some sort of oath. At that time, said Alain, there was a fatal motor accident. To Captain O'Brien, yes, Mr. Alain. Good Lord, ejaculated Alain involuntarily. Do you mean to say that you have realized that— I knew Captain O'Brien was Lady Carrados's first husband, naturally. But, said Alain, did you never think of telling Lady Carrados that there was this, well, this link between you? Oh, no, said Miss Harris. It would not have been at all my place to bring it up. When I was given the list of vacant posts at the Friendly Cousins Registry Office, I thought this seemed the most suitable, and I said to my friend Miss Smith, What an extraordinary coincidence! Because when I learned of Lady Carrados's former name, I realized it must be the same, and I said to Smithy, I think that must be an omen. So I applied for the post. I see, said Alain. And do you remember Sir Herbert, too? Oh, yes. Sir Herbert was the gentleman in the car. You see, I had the pleasure of returning a letter that had been left behind at the vicarage. That is an absolute lie, said Carrados loudly. Pardon me, said Miss Harris, but I am speaking the truth. Thank you, Miss Harris, said Alain quickly. Would you mind waiting outside for a moment, Fox? Fox shepherded her out. By God, began Carrados, if you take the word of a— Wait a moment, said Alain. Our case, Sir Herbert, is that you did in fact take this letter, and never gave it to the lady who afterwards married you. Our case is that you kept it for eighteen years in the drawer of a writing desk in your study. Lady Carrados spoke directly to her husband. All these years you have watched me, and known how much I suffered. You hid the letter. You knew I was being blackmailed. You've always been jealous of Paddy. You wrote those letters. It's you. Carrados shook his head from side to side. No, he said. No, Evelyn, no. Sir Herbert, said Alain, do you deny you kept this letter in the secret drawer of that desk? Yes. Fox went out and returned with Bridget. Lady Carrados gave a little cry and caught at her daughter's hand. Miss O'Brien, said Alain, you told me that on one occasion when you were alone in the study of your stepfather's house, you examined the miniature writing cabinet in that room. You told me that when you pressed a tiny screw, a triangular drawer opened out of the cabinet, and that there was a letter in it. Is this true? It's quite true, said Bridget. Your stepfather came into the study at this juncture? Yes. What was his attitude when he saw what you had done? He was very angry indeed. What did he do? He twisted my arm and bruised it. A lie! The child has always hated me! Everything I try to do for her! A lie! A wicked, spiteful lie! Fox, said Alain, will you ask Sir Daniel to come in? Sir Daniel came in almost immediately. Sir Daniel, said Alain, 
I've asked you to come in as I understand you were witness to a scene which Miss O'Brien has just described to us. On this particular visit, you went into the study and talked to Miss O'Brien about a small French writing cabinet. You told her that there was probably a secret drawer in the box. Then you went upstairs to see Lady Carrados. Yes. When you returned, were Miss O'Brien and Sir Herbert together in the study? Yes, said Davidson, and set his lips in a firm line. Sir Daniel, did you examine Miss O'Brien's arm when you returned to the study? I did said Davidson, turning his back on Carrados. What did you find? A certain amount of contusion. To what cause did you attribute these bruises? They suggested that the arm had been tightly held and twisted. What were the relative positions of Sir Herbert and his stepdaughter when you came into the study? He held her by the arm. Would it be correct to say he was storming at her? He was shouting a good deal, certainly, said Davidson dryly. Thank you, Sir Daniel. Will you and Miss O'Brien wait outside? We'll see Mr. Dimitri. Davidson and Bridget both went out. Dimitri was ushered in by Fox. He was very sleek, oil on his hair, scent on his person. He bowed extensively. Good evening, my lady. Good evening, gentlemen. Mr. Dimitri, Alain began, I— Stop! Carrados had got to his feet. He slowly extended his arm and pointed to Dimitri. The action was both ridiculous and alarming. What's he doing here? My God, now I know. I know. Well, Sir Herbert, what do you know? Stop, I tell you. I did it. I did it. I confess. I confess everything. I did it. You did what, Sir Herbert? It was the A.C.'s voice, very quiet and matter-of-fact. I kept the letter, for God's sake. Carrados said. Let this go no further. It's a private matter between my wife and myself. It has gone much further than that, said Alain. Did you not in fact write blackmailing letters to your wife purely in order to torture her mind? You fool! shouted Carrados. It is I who have dreaded what might happen. The letter was stolen. Stolen! Now, said Alain, it seems we are going to get the truth. When did you miss the letter? It was when we came back from Newmarket. That evening I was alone in my study, and being there I tried the hidden drawer. It was empty. And do you know who was alone in my room on May the ninth? Yes, said Alain. It was Mr. Columbo Dimitri. Ah, said Carrados shakily. Ah, now we're getting at it. Lady Carrados, do you believe that the only source from which your blackmailer could have got his information was the letter lost on the day of Captain O'Brien's accident? Yes. Alain took an envelope from his pocket. Was the blackmailing letter written in a similar style to this? It was exactly like that. If I tell you that the lady to whom this letter is addressed had been blackmailed as you have been blackmailed, and that we have positive evidence that the man who wrote this address was Columbo Dimitri, are you prepared to charge him with blackmail? Yes. It is completely false, said Dimitri. I shall sue for libel. His face was ashen. Before we go any further, said Alain, I think I should explain that Lord Robert Gospel was in the confidence of Scotland Yard as regards these blackmailing letters. He was working for us on the case. We've got his signed statement that leaves no doubt at all that Mr. Dimitri collected a sum of money at a concert held at the Constant Street Hall on Thursday, June the 3rd. Lord Robert actually watched Mr. Dimitri collect this money. On June the 8th, Lady Carrados gave a ball at Marston House. Lord Robert was there. He also knew that Lady Carrados was the victim of blackmail. Is that right, Lady Carrados? Yes. Now, said Alain, Lord Robert rang me up at one o'clock and told me he now had enough evidence. The conversation was interrupted by someone who must have overheard at least one very significant phrase. Two and a half hours later, Lord Robert was murdered. Dimitri screamed. False! False! I am not an assassin! I am innocent! Cristo mio, I am innocent! He burst into tears. I am innocent! He sobbed. The blessed saints bear witness to my innocence! Unfortunately, said Alain, their evidence is not acceptable in a court of law. Will you ask Mrs. Halkett Hackett to come in, please, Fox? Mrs. Halkett Hackett, looking like a beauty specialist's mistake, came into the office. She sat down and drew up her bust until it seemed to perch like some superstructure on a rigid foundation. Then she saw Lady Carrados. An extraordinary look passed between the two women. Mrs. Halkett Hackett, said Alain, 
You have told me that after a charade party you gave in December, you found that a document which you valued was missing from a box on your dressing table. Had this man, Columbo Dimitri, an opportunity of being alone in this room? Why, yes, she said. He certainly had. Lord Robert sat near you at the Sermione Quartet's concert on June the 3rd. Do you remember that this man, Columbo Dimitri, sat not very far away from you? Why, yes. Your bag was stolen that afternoon? Yes. She looked again at Lady Carrados, who suddenly leant forward and touched her hand. I'm so sorry, she said. I too. Indeed, you have nothing to fear from us. We have suffered too. I have made up my mind to hide nothing now. Will you help by also hiding nothing? Oh, my dear, said Mrs. Halkett Hackett in a whisper. Would it have been possible for Dimitri to have taken your bag while you were out of the concert room, said Alain. Lord Robert must have seen, said Mrs. Halkett Hackett. Lord Robert did see. The dead, cried Dimitri. I cannot be accused by the dead. Alain took from his pocket the cigarette case with the medallion. This is yours, isn't it? he asked Mrs. Halkett Hackett. Yes, I've told you so. You left it in the green sitting room at Marsden House? Yes. You had seen Lord Robert coming upstairs? Yes. Alain nodded to Fox, who again left the room. After you had joined your partner in the other sitting-out room, you discovered the loss of your case. Yes, I did. Your partner fetched it. She wetted her lips. Yes. The door opened and Withers walked in after Fox. Hello, he said. What's the idea? I have invited you to come here, Captain Withers, in order that the Assistant Commissioner may hear your statement about your movements on the night of the ball at Marsden House. I have discovered that although you left Marsden House at 3.30, you did not arrive at the Matador nightclub until 4.15. You therefore have no alibi for the murder of Lord Robert Gospel. Withers looked at Mrs. Halkett Hackett with a sort of sneer. She can give me one. She looked at him and spoke to Alain. Between the time we left the ball and the time we got to the Matador, Captain Withers drove me about in his car. I was afraid of my husband. I'd seen him watching me. I wanted to talk to Captain Withers. Very well. Now, to return to Marsden House, you told me that at one o'clock you were in the sitting room at the head of the stairs. You did not tell me that you were also in the telephone room. Why should I? said Withers. You were in the telephone room with Mrs. Halkett Hackett before you went to the other room. You returned to it from the other room to fetch this. Alain's long arms shot up. Seven pairs of eyes were concentrated on the gold cigarette case with the jeweled medallion. Where did you find this case? On a table in the room with a telephone. When I asked you yesterday if you ever heard Lord Robert telephoning in this room, you denied it. There wasn't anybody in the room when I fetched the case. Is there any reason why anybody, say Mr. Dimitri, should not have gone into the telephone room after you left it with Mrs. Halkett Hackett and before you returned for the case? No reason at all. Dimitri, said Alain, have you seen this case before? Never. Take it in your hands. Look at it. Dimitri took the case. Open it. Dimitri opened it. From where Alain stood, he could see the little cutting from the times. Dimitri saw it too. His eyes dilated. The case dropped through his hands to the floor. He pointed a shaking finger at Alain. I think you must be the devil himself, he whispered. Fox, said Alain, will you pass the case round? It passed from hand to hand. Withers seemed quite unmoved by the cutting. The Caradoses both looked blankly at it and passed it on. Mrs. Halkett Hackett opened the case and stared at the scrap of paper. This wasn't here before, she said. What is it? Who put it here? I'm sorry, said Alain. It will come off quite easily. He took the case from her. Dimitri suddenly leapt to his feet. Sit down, Mr. Dimitri, said Alain. I am going. I can endure no longer. I am an innocent man, a man of standing with a clientele of great excellence. I will see a lawyer. My God, let me pass. He plunged forward. Alain caught him by one arm, Fox by the other. He struggled violently. The A.C. pressed a bell and two plainclothes men walked into the room. Dimitri was taken over by the two officers. Now then, they said, now then. Lady Carrados, said Alain, will you formally charge this man? I do charge him. 
In a moment, said Alain to Dimitri, you will be taken to the charge room, but before we talk about the exact nature of the charge, he looked through the door. Sir Daniel, may I trouble you again for a moment? Davidson, looking very startled, came through. Good God, Alain, he said, staring at Dimitri. What's this? Alain said. You see this cigarette case? Davidson took it. My dear fellow, he said. That's the abortion I told you about. It's part of the collection at Marsden House, you remember? He moved to the light, and after another startled glance at Dimitri, who stared at him like a lost soul, Davidson put up his glasses and examined the case. You know, I believe it is Benvenuto. Yes, yes, I dare say. Will you tell us where you saw it? Among a collection of objets d'art on a pie-crust table in an upstairs room at Marsden House. At what time, Sir Daniel? At about eleven-thirty or so, perhaps earlier. Would you swear that you noticed it no later than eleven-thirty, insisted Alain. But of course I would. He held the cigarette case up in his beautifully shaped hand. I swear I saw this case on the table in the green sitting room not later than eleven-thirty. That do? And then, surprisingly clear and firm, Mrs. Halkett Hackett's voice. But that can't be true. Alain said, Will you open the case? Davidson, who was gazing in amazement at Mrs. Halkett Hackett, opened the cigarette case and saw the notice. Will you read that press cutting? said Alain. Aloud, please. The expressive voice read the absurd message. Chaldy, darling, living in exile, longing, only want daughter, daddy. What in the name of all wonders is this? We believe it to be a murderer's message, said Alain. We think this man, Dimitri, can translate it. Davidson shut the case with a snap. Something had gone wrong with his hands. They shook so violently that the diamonds on the gold case seemed to have a separate flashing life of their own. So Dimitri is a murderer, he said. Look out, said Alain loudly. Dimitri flung himself forward and his hands were at Davidson's throat before his guards had regained their hold on him. In a moment the room was full of struggling men. That's better, said Alain's voice. Now then, hands together. A sharp click, a cry from Dimitri, and then the figures resolved themselves into a sort of tableau. Dimitri handcuffed and held by three men against the desk. Davidson, in the centre of the room with Alain, Fox, and a plain-clothes man grasping his arms behind his back— the assistant commissioner between the two groups, like a distinguished sort of referee. Murderer! screamed Dimitri. I confess! I confess! I have worked for him for seven years, and now, now, now he will let me go to the gallows for the crime he himself committed. I will tell you everything. Everything. Speak up, Rory, said the A.C. Daniel Davidson said Alain. I arrest you for the murder of Lord Robert Gospel. I thought, said Alain, that you would like to know at once, Mildred. Lady Mildred Potter shook her head. Are you sure you are not mistaken? Quite sure. Davidson saw the open drawer and the letter in Carrados's writing cabinet. Davidson came in on the scene between Carrados and Bridget. He told Dimitri about the secret drawer and instructed Dimitri to steal the letter. Dimitri collected the handbags of the blackmailed ladies. He wrote the letters. Sometimes he got the ideas. Mrs. Halkett Hackett's trinket box was one of Dimitri's brightest ideas, I imagine. Uh, I'm lost in it, Roderick. Troy, darling, do you understand? I think I'm beginning to, said Troy. There were three things that I could not fit into the pattern said Alain. Davidson told me he saw a certain cigarette case in the green sitting room at about eleven-thirty. We found that the cigarette case in question was only in this room for about four minutes around about one o'clock, during which the telephone conversation took place. Why should Davidson lie? He had thought the case was one of the Marsden House possessions. He stated that he did not overhear the conversation and indeed did not return to the room after eleven-thirty. But Bunchy said to me, he might as well mix his damn brews with poison. Davidson must have overheard that sentence. Bunchy was talking about Dimitri, of course, but I believe Davidson thought he was talking about him. As for the figure Miss Harris saw beyond the glass panel, 
Undoubtedly, it was Davidson's. Then there is the other cigarette case, I mean the weapon. On the morning after the murder, I asked to see Davidson's case. He showed me a case that was certainly too small for the job. I noticed how immaculate it was, looked closely at it, and found traces of plate powder in the tooling. We learnt that Davidson's cases were cleaned the morning before the ball and had not been touched after the ball. This case shone like a mirror, and I would have sworn had not been used since it was put in his pocket. It looked as if he had lied when he said it was the case he took to Marston House. And then there was the condition. Is Mildred asleep? Yes, said Lady Mildred. Do you mind very much, dear Roderick, if I go to bed? Troy, my dear, you will look after poor Roderick, won't you? I don't know where Donald is just now. I think he took Bridget Carrados home, said Alain, opening the door for Mildred. Evelyn and her husband wanted to be alone, and Donald was in the waiting room looking hopeful. <laughs> he seems to be very attached to her, said Mildred. Is she a nice girl, Roderick? Very nice. I think she'll look after him. Alain shut the door after her and returned to Troy, who looked sideways at him. How extraordinarily well-trained your eye must be, to notice the grains of plate powder in the tooling of a cigarette case. Could anything be more admirable? What else did you notice? I noticed that, although your eyes are grey, there are little flecks of green in them. I noticed that the third finger of your left hand has a little spot of vermilion on the inside where a ring should hide it. Please tell me the end of the case. All right. Where was I? You'd got to the third point against Davidson. Yes. The third point was in the method used in committing the crime. The only real mark of violence was the scar made by the cigarette case. A doctor would realise how little force was needed, and Bunchy's doctor would know how great an ally that weak heart would be. He kept his head marvellously when I interviewed him, did Sir Daniel. We're searching his house tonight. Fox is there now. I don't think we'll find anything except the lethal cigarette case. But I've more hopes of Dimitri's desk. What about the cloak and hat? That brings us to a very curious episode. This afternoon we heard of a parcel that had been dumped at the main western office during the rush hour yesterday. It was addressed to somewhere in China, and when I was in Davidson's waiting room I saw several illustrated brochures appealing for old clothes for the Central Chinese Medical Mission at God knows where. It's our purpose, my dear Troy, to get one of those brochures and write to the Central Chinese Mission asking for further information. There's one other point which has been kindly elucidated by the gibbering Dimitri. This morning he sent his servant out for a Times. When we heard of this, we had a look at the Times, too. We found the agony column notice that read like this, Childy, darling, living in exile, longing, only want daughter, daddy. And we noticed in our brilliant way that the initial letters read C, D, lie low, D, D which might not be too fancifully elaborated into Columbo Dimitri Lilo Daniel Davidson. And in fact, Mr. Dimitri confessed to this artless device. It was arranged, he said, that if anything unprecedented, untoward, unanticipated ever occurred, Davidson would communicate with Dimitri in precisely this manner. What about Dimitri and Withers? Julie charged. The one with blackmail, the other with running a gaming house. They are extremely nasty fellows. Now, Troy, I love you more than anything in life. I've tried humility. I've tried effrontery. If you can't love me, tell me so. And please, let us not meet again, because I can't manage meeting you unless it is to love you. Troy looked solemnly at him. I know my mind at last, she said. I couldn't be parked. Darling, darling Troy. I do love you. Very much indeed. Wonder of the world, cried Alain, and took her in his arms. <laughs>